So um, I guess what I want to illustrate in the remaining 30 minutes or so is the historical aspect that I was alluding to in the discovery of atomic nucleus and Bohr's theory of hydrogen atom. There's two wonderful simulations on the Fed website, which I think will be great for out illustrating this. I think uh, one of these two simulations are new. Um, so I actually haven't seen it before. We'll see how that goes. Uh, it's the Rutherford scattering. This is really the uh, experiment that, that established the existence of atomic nucleus, which uh, led into the Bohr model. So, um, so yeah, let me use this simulation to uh, briefly describe Rutherford experiment, which is described in the uh, chapter section 13.5. So you can take a look at that too. If you prefer to read, it's all here. Um, discovery of atomic beam, not atomic beam, sorry, um, beta ray electron, and then the discovery of nucleus. Here's the uh, figures and the written description. Let me use this simulation to what Rutherford was doing. Um, let me start out with a plum pudding atom because um, this is the model that Rutherford was trying to, um, trying to, he kind of, he actually didn't believe in this model and he was setting out to disprove this model. So you can kind of imagine this as a model of, um, of the, well, let's say it's gold, um, uh, gold atom. So gold atom from the studies that were done previously, people knew that it has a lot of electrons in it. That's what these small dots uh, represent, electrons. And because we know gold atom to be electrically neutral, if it contains electrons, it must uh, contain positive charges. And what plum, pudding, uh, uh, what plum pudding model has is it has this positive charge distributed in a uniform kind of way over the size of the atom so that these uh, electrons can be embedded into it in a stable way. And so uh, Rutherford realized that he can use uh, a, a radioactive phenomena that he's been working with for a while called alpha decay, which we'll get to in chapter 15. He realized that he could use that as an experimental tool to probe, literally, figuratively, no, literally, probe into this atom. Literally, in the sense that these alpha particles, um, which we'll later learn is the helium-4 nucleus, has enough energy to penetrate through this matter. So um, this is the schematic representation of the experiment. Rutherford has a source of alpha particle. He has a kind of a, uh, atomic target that's uh, spread out as thin as possible. He, that's why he chose gold because it's possible to spread out gold foil super thin. And he um, kind of fired this alpha particle. He had the detectors all around to detect those alpha particles. Let's see what happens when we fire it. Uh, wait, I can't do this one at a time. That's a super uh, all right, well, so that's what you would expect to see. Can I do traces? Yeah. So um, because these alpha particles have so much energy, let me see what happens if I have tried to have super low energy. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, even, so most of the alpha sources have uh, alpha particle with so much energy that basically all of them would be expected to go through mostly undeflected. This, um, it's like, you know, imagine shooting bullet through air. That's basically what this is. Or I guess bullet through tissue paper. Uh, that's what you would expect to see. And, um, and what Rutherford was hoping to see was he was hoping to not see this. And he was right. He did not see this. That's why he had the detectors all around hoping to detect deflections. Now, what it, what it did see was nonetheless uh, surprising. So, um, so let me, without going too far into this, let me just uh, show um, what Rutherford, uh, yeah. uh, let me see what this does. 
Hmm. I guess we could do that. Um, uh, I think this is a little bit too busy. There's too much things going on. Let me imagine just focusing on a single arm here. That's what the second option is. So in, so um, you will have to kind of ignore what you see at the center. Let me turn on the traces that will help you see what Rutherford was seeing. So, um, so a big part of what Rutherford was seeing is actually better, rep is it better represented here? So, um, well, maybe a little bit, it, okay, it's a bit exaggerated. So you see some of these particles that are going through mostly undeflected. And that actually makes up a vast majority of the alpha particles. So at, for the detector that's positioned here, you know, it detects most of the alpha particles. So that, all right, that's there. Um, what Rutherford was seeing and what led him to posit this model that you see represented here are these large deflections. So that's uh, what Rutherford is quoted as saying, it says if you shot a, I don't know, 20 caliber bullet and uh, at a tissue paper and it came back and hit you. You see in these um, schematic uh, representations, these alpha particles, depending on how close they are to the head-on collision, they go through different amounts of deflection. And the thing that was very surprising to Rutherford was that you had these alpha particles that have basically come to a complete stop and deflected through a very large angle. And for that to be possible, he had to uh, modify from this plum pudding atom, which had the most of the mass of the atom and the positive charge spread out over a large area into very compact, very small area. And I keep saying this is kind of exaggerated scale. This is exaggerated scale because if this diameter is meant to ref reflect the size of an atom, 10 to minus 10 meters, then this size of the nucleus should really be 10 to minus 14, 10,000 times smaller um, by uh, radius. So, um, so that's how small the, the atomic nucleus had to be to fit with the experimental observation. So that's the discovery of atomic nucleus. It comes from this uh, experiment that Roth, uh, wait, what's the Rutherford's first name? Well, Rutherford designed, did, and then he figured out this is the only model, one um, that puts all the masses of the atom in a very tight, confined space is what's uh, able to describe the experimental results that he saw. Now, once you do that, then you have a bit of a dilemma or a problem. The motivation for this plum pudding model was really to have an electrostatically stable configuration of electrons and protons. That's what the motivation here was. But experiment is saying that's not realistic. That's not possible. Then, then, uh, then what other model is there? That's what this uh, simulation is uh, exploring. Models of hydrogen atom. I think I actually used this simulation earlier when we were talking about sci uh, scientific models. So uh, if you remember that from the first week of the semester, great. Now that we are here, uh, where we are actually talking about um, um, talking about quantum mechanics, I can actually just run through what the uh, what the um, the, the different predictions due to different models are. And that's what um, this uh, section 13.6 is getting at. It, uh, it gets at Bohr's, so you know, 13.6 describes Bohr's theory of hydrogen atom, which is the model that won out over other possible models. And let me, uh, to give this model a context, let me give you the description of the other models of hydrogen atom. 
So the simplest model of hydrogen atom is kind of the Greek, uh, as in ancient Greece, Greek uh, imagination of the atom. Uh, and kind of indivisible uh, uh, particle of matter. And if that's the case, then when you fire, uh, so all these particles represent photon light, they will all um, kind of reflect um, in the same way, regardless of wavelength. And um, experiments show both uh, in many different ways that that's just not the case how light um, bounces off of matter depends on wavelength. That's why you see different colors. That's why, you know, so, so billiard ball model fails uh, for that reason. Also, you know, it's kind of great philosophy, not modern physics. <laughs> and plum pudding model would give a similar, uh, um, similar explanation, but through classical physics, as in this incoming wave of electromagnetic wave would shake the electrons inside an atom and that electron would re-emit the light. And this dependence might have some dependence on wavelength, but not very strong. Um, so I don't know why it's building up that way. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, plum pudding model, we also reject that for a different reason, the Rutherford experiment. Then, so the remainder of the models start out with the conclusion of Rutherford's experiment as the starting point, that there is an atomic nucleus that contains almost all the mass of the atom, all the mass of the positive charge, and you still have to have somehow um, um, electro, somehow stable configuration of the positive charge, and a negative charge that still adds up to the size of the atom. And uh, physicists drew inspiration from nature. They try to look at, okay, what other thing has uh, kind of relatively compact particles that make up a larger system. And they realize our solar system is kind of like that. So this is what classical solar system represents. And um, a lot of people worked on their model. And this is what this model would end up predicting. It's a bit of fun, but hey, what happened? Um, okay, let me stop the simulation. So, okay, I paused the simulation. So when you, let me make the simulation so first of all, when you start the simulation, this is what you're seeing. So you have a proton, that's the atomic nucleus for the hydrogen atom. And you have an electron that's going to be in orbit. And it just ends up losing orbit super quickly. And the reason for this is the, um, it's, a, um, it's a theory of electromagnetism. We talked about in chapter 12, how oscillating charge produces electromagnetic wave. This electron that's an orbiting proton, that's an oscillating charge. And that oscillating charge has to emit electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves carry away energy. And if this electron is losing energy, then it must spiral into the proton, almost like a satellite around the Earth that's losing orbit because it's losing energy due to friction. It crashes into Earth. So electron has to do something like that. So this classical solar system model of hydrogen atom gives you basically absurd prediction that hydrogen atoms won't be um, stable, which is once again absurd. That's not true. So, um, so that's what baffled the scientists until Bohr came up with his model, where he um, kind of posited these stable orbits of electrons. And, he, and these stable orbits basically come from the assumption that the angular momentum of these electrons are, um, that they are uh, quantized. And that's what these uh, stable orbits represent. And the experimental results that people get with that, um, the, which is the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, matches with the predictions that Bohr model produces. Well, quote unquote prediction because he already knew what would be. And um, 
So that's uh, really the reason people were accepting the Bohr model, that it gave a, a result that agreed with the experiment. And with the De Bruyne wavelength hypothesis, you can kind of expand this model a little bit. Think of each of these stable orbits as representing a standing wave of electron, which you know, depending on your point of view, may be better grounded. And um, I was saying earlier how even this is not really the correct, um, fully correct picture of uh, hydrogen atom. That we don't actually think about electron orbits in this way. Uh, this Schrodinger model is uh, what we, it, that's a fully correct model. In chemistry, you might have heard of electron clouds. That's what this uh, is representing. And um, it's uh, difficult to talk about this electron cloud in a way that's not incorrect um, without super complicated maths. I won't do that. Only to say that uh, when chemists tell you about electron orbitals and show you pretty pictures that look like that, believe them. That's our modern understanding of hydrogen atom. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. So I think that's all the time I have. I hope this uh, is uh, somehow useful to you in getting started on really the set of topics that I was in a hurry to get to. This is the interesting aspect of physics. This is where I hope uh, you will, um, uh, well, that this is where I hope uh, if you weren't already interested in physics that you will get interested in physics. And for many of you who are in allied health, Chapter 15 is where it'll get super interesting because there's like medical imaging and diagnosis. I think that's really the reason your program requires physics. 